So before I introduce our esteemed uh, guest speaker today, I'm going to share a couple of logistics with everyone. First off, I have two, not one, but two extra credit opportunities for you. Uh, the first is, and they're both next week, right? So these are external lectures. If you attend, if you register and attend, uh, this takes the place of one classroom attendance. Um, <clears throat> so this is our next creative conversation. The next one in our series, this is Tuesday, October 13th at 4 p.m. Uh, another great panel. And again, this will, get, this will be about an hour. And uh, this one is covering uh, not just arts and um, education, but really looking at other sectors too. So we have someone from the city's Office of Innovation and Technology, uh, someone representing Esperanza Art Center, and then someone from the William Way LGBT Center. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, where'd my chat window go? I don't know where my chat window went, but I will, uh, there we go. I'm putting the registration link for you in the chat right now. So, and this is of course in this class Blackboard site as well. You can find the link there. Next, two opportunities next week. Thursday, October 15th at 5.30, uh, we're hosting Natalie Nixon. Natalie's a fantastic speaker. She's also a recent book author of a book called The Creativity Leap, which is all about, you know, how do you apply creativity in your life, in your business, in your work? Um, this is uh, 5.30 next Thursday, October 15th. And the registration link, again, I'm putting this in the in the messages, in the chat. Okay, and again, both of those opportunities are in the course Blackboard page as well. So uh, you can find the links there, right? And they're both of each about an hour. And, you know, again, if this attending one of these takes the place of, uh, oh, I see why. I'm not chatting to everybody. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, I was just sending it to the presenters. Okay, you see number one. And okay, can you see that now? Hopefully, great. And here's number two, great. Okay, and then really quick, I made you do all these surveys and things. So I just thought I'd share a little bit about the class and some of your responses, right? Asked you all uh, first week, what kind of, what's your favorite music? And so for all of us, this is just a little snapshot of, you know, everyone's favorite music or musical genre. Lots of hip hop fans here, some pop, you know, uh, a lot of distribution. There were lots of other categories I'm not showing here because there are only one or one or two responses. Uh, uh, you know, these aren't the ideal ways of categorizing things, but I think it shows you that there's, you know, obviously a wide variety of tastes in the class, but you know, obviously hip hop and pop. Um, <laughs> no way jazz is that low. Okay, well, you guys can fight over it uh, in, in the chat. Okay, and then I asked you, what was your favorite TV or movie during COVID? Now, we had a really, really broad range of answers on this. I have almost everything only had one vote, but the things with two or more votes are, were listed over here. Ozark, and okay, not bad. Oh, uh, the Office, yeah, classic. Lovecraft Country, I haven't seen it yet, heard good, really good things. Uh, this was interesting. Don't watch movies or TV, actually had, you know, two votes there. Okay, but on top, we have The Boys and The Umbrella Academy. So I definitely give a hat tip to you who, who like the Umbrella Academy. I've watched both seasons, it's pretty awesome. So I uh, haven't watched the boys at all. Maybe I'll take a look at that too, based on your reactions. Okay, so with that, we're gonna, let me introduce our special guest speaker for today. Uh, he is a highly accomplished researcher with nearly a decade or more of experience now in machine learning technologies. He received his bachelor's from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and his master's and PhD from our fair institution, Drexel University. He's been a National Science Foundation graduate fellow and authored numerous academic publications. He's also an app developer, he has built an iPhone app that collected data for public speaking and public presenters, as well as a web app to collect data on audio for research in emotion detection in music. He is now currently VP of AI Technologies at Lithero, a Philadelphia startup that is applying AI and natural language processing in the life sciences. I also happen to know that he lives an alternate life as a DJ. So please welcome Dr. Brandon Morton. Take it away. 
Uh, thank you, Young Moon. It's a great introduction. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I'm going to start and say um, this week has been very interesting. Uh, Lithro, we launched our first client this week. So it's been a lot of late nights and uh, just uh, a really different uh, kind of side of, of what the company, the startup life has kind of been uh, uh, for me for the past year. I've been with Lithro for about two years now. Um, and so uh, very excited, uh, also very tired. Um, so uh, I'm going to rely on you guys to kind of give me some energy. So I'm loving the clapping and the, uh, the interaction with the, uh, the, uh, the, ch the chat. So uh, please, please keep it coming. <laughs> Um, so let me share my screen with you all so you can see um, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. There we go. Um, so today I I'm, 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 was asked to kind of talk to you guys about how engineering relates to startups and um, I uh, just kind of give you my experiences about uh, what I did with my degree, uh, how I ended up as a, a, a VP of a startup, and kind of the roadmap that I took, and just kind of offer you know my opinions and my advice about you know what uh, what that looks like and what uh, what it takes to to kind of take your engineering degree and turn it into something that you can use for a startup. Um, I want to start here uh, because. Uh, this is kind of where everything started for me. Um, uh, a lot of people start in high school, but really, I started to really love engineering in undergrad. Uh, as Young Moo said, I went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, we're known for two things. Uh, number one is, uh, if I remember correctly, we produced the most uh, African-American PhD candidates in the country. Uh, I was actually part of that program. It's called the Myrov program. They do a really good job of uh, prepping students who um, really had no idea about getting into um, graduate school. Um, they kind of get them on the mindset of going down that road. Um, the other thing is that they are the only school that has been a number 16 seed in NCAA and being a number one seed. Uh, this happened in 2018, if I remember correctly. It might have been 2017. They beat uh, UVA. Uh, I watched that game and, and I cried a little bit at the end of it. So uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of background of where I'm from. Um, uh, <coughs> oh, let me see. There we go. OK. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, so uh, UMBC. UMBC was great. Uh, so while at UMBC, I was a computer engineer. Um, when I originally started to go to school, I wanted to get into computer science, actually. And after talking with uh, my dad's uh, co-workers, uh, the, the thing that convinced me to become an engineer was, was quite simple. Uh, he said, and uh, I know better now, but he said that uh, there's no money in computer science, all the money is in engineering. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I immediately signed up for the first computer engineering class I could find and um, kind of proceeded to, to to kind of go down the engineering route. Um, <clears throat> uh, undergrad was great. Uh, I had a lot of uh, great opportunities to um, um, a lot of great opportunities to to meet new people and to to kind of take advantage of all that uh, Maryland and Baltimore had to offer. Uh, I grew up in Newark, Delaware, which is a really small. Kind of town so to be able to kind of go to baltimore which in my at that time was a, a big city for me um we didn't get a chance to go to philadelphia that often so going to baltimore was kind of a big deal um so learning how to navigate in a, a city or we were actually outside of a city but you know close enough that you know we, we say we're from baltimore um <clears throat> So dealing with that, uh, learning how to be academically uh, proficient without having my parents and you know my teachers kind of sitting over top of me. Uh, that was something I had to learn. Uh, I had to learn that pretty early. Um, I did very well my first semester. My second semester, I had some trouble because I got a little cocky. Uh, so I had to kind of rein it in uh, after that. Um, but uh, 
yeah, it was just a great opportunity to meet people who, are, who had different opinions about things. And, and I'm sure you all have heard about this before, um, about, you know, just the, the kind of experience that, that uh, the undergrad and college has to offer for you. Um, let me see what else. Uh, again, I, I talked about the that scholarship program a little bit, and one of the great things that they did was they forced you. What? Well, not forced you, but one of the, the requirements to to keep the scholarship was that you had to go on a uh, summer internship or some type of research experience every year. So I got an opportunity to uh, experience research, um, which is what really kind of drew me into uh, the research world and um, kind of deciding to go that route instead of the corporate route um, right after I got out of school. Um, I, I worked for IBM for a couple of years. Uh, I did some research at, at Stevens University where we uh, got to play around with robots and, and um, some pretty cool like vision software. Um, <clears throat> let me see, uh, what else did I do? I, I got a chance to work at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, uh, just working on uh, some software for them. Um, so it's just a, a great opportunity to kind of get a, a wide balance of of uh things that um are uh, you wouldn't normally necessarily get a chance to take uh, if you if you just took your summers off uh so i know that's not really an issue for you all because you have the co-op built into the drexel program uh, but i would say definitely take advantage of that um think about the things that you like to do especially in the last year the classes that you took that you like and seek out the co-op opportunities um uh, we were able to kind of experience what it's like using those tools and those skills. Um, uh, go, glad to see that uh, most of your computer engineers uh, uh, just uh, really appreciate that, and we are a, a dying breed. So uh, you know, keep it uh, keep it going. Um, the uh, I guess the 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 biggest kind of takeaway I can take about uh, from undergrad was uh, building out a relationship with uh, my professors. Um, it was something that I really actually took for granted. Um, <clears throat> just because it was so easy to um, to just not interact with them, uh, unfortunately. Um, we, uh, UMBC is not a, a big school, but it's a commuter school. So basically everyone leaves at the end of the day, uh, including the professors. So office hours were kind of scheduled um, when other classes were happening or when you wanted to go grab lunch and things like that. So uh, for the majority of the time there, uh, I didn't really interact with professors. It wasn't until like my senior year that I actually uh, was strongly considering graduate school and research and kind of wanted to get an idea about what it was like. So I went to uh, a professor, kind of asked about some of the work that he was doing. Uh, I had taken his class, I'd done pretty well in the class. Um, but it wasn't like, you know, we were, you know, best friends exchanging recipes and things like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I asked him about his lab and what he did and, uh, gave me opportunities to kind of, uh, take on a project and kind of build them out, build out a, a piece of software for them. And, uh, it was just a really cool experience, um, where I kind of got to take what I learned in class and apply it to, uh, what I thought at the time was like a real world problem. Um, and uh, just give me an opportunity to learn what it's like to work in a research lab and have to answer to uh, a, an advisor versus a, uh, a professor who is interested in, um, you know, grades versus interested in actually developing the, the product or, or the, uh, the research that you are, um, uh, that you're responsible for. So um, <clears throat> one of the things I can say is undergrad, if you have the opportunity, please, please, please build some relationships with your, um, your professor. Uh, at the very least, they're a great resource um, to um, help you with um, recommendation letters, uh, but that's the very, very least that they can offer you. So I, I would say please go above and beyond and, uh, you know, get to know their labs, uh, their the work that they've done, uh, you know, get to know what they uh, did to become a PhD, like why they chose to go that route. Uh, there's a lot of information there. And uh, they're natural teachers, so they want to share that information with you. So please, please take advantage of it. Um, let me see. Okay, so after an undergrad, um, <coughs> I, uh, I had the opportunity to, to uh, join a great research lab, lab in the Music and Entertainment Technology Lab over at um, uh, Drexel. Uh, uh, Young Moo was a great advisor. Um, 
And uh, I just remember being really excited about um, getting into, number one, getting into grad school. Um, I, uh, it was just interesting that that whole um, process of uh, applying to grad schools and, and taking the the, GR, the GREs and everything like that was just a, a really interesting kind of process. Like I, I was in uh, Pittsburgh, I had to drive to University of Pennsylvania to take my GREs, and it was just a really weird. So I, I had very low expectations about getting into not getting into grad school, but just just low thoughts about the entire process. Um, and I ended up going into a, a really great, uh, great lab. And primarily the reason that I chose a lab, I don't know if Young Wu knows this or not, um, but it was because when I came to meet with you, um, uh, I'd, I'd gone to a couple other labs and your lab was the, the most, um, it seemed like the students got along the most. Uh, they built kind of, um, it just seemed like they were friends, like they, they related to each other outside of, of the lab and things like that. And, and coming from a, um, a uh, undergrad where we had a really big build, uh, support system built into it with the uh, scholarship program that I was talking about, uh, it was something that I was looking for was I didn't want to just come in and be by myself and to see that the way that your students kind of interacted, it was, it was really cool. So that was, that was actually a big reason why I joined the lab. I don't know if I ever told you that or not, but uh, yeah. Um, but while I was in Young Moo's lab, I got a, a, an amazing opportunity, a, a bunch of amazing opportunities um, to, um, number one, to get a, a great degree in uh, electrical engineering and learn about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, but I also got an opportunity to take that engineering degree and all those skills um, and teach people. Uh, so this photo here that you see me, um, so can you hear me now? Uh, I'm gonna try and speak, okay, great. Um, so I uh, got a great uh, opportunity to teach. Uh, initially it was as a TA, um, I, was, I was teaching the, uh, I don't know if they even have this class anymore, but it was uh, Digital Logic, uh, ECES 201, I think it was. Um, uh, it was just interesting to kind of sit on that side of, um, <laughs> Uh, interesting to sit on uh, uh, that side of a classroom uh, where uh, students were coming to me and kind of asking me to explain them concepts that I understood as a student, uh, but it's a very different thing to teach. Uh, yeah, ECE 200, I think, yeah. Uh, it's a very different thing to teach um, uh, a student as it is to learn kind of the material. So uh, after I quickly went back and, and read over trying to, uh, to, to basically relearn, you know, digital logic. Um, then trying to be able to explain it to a student who needed help with a problem and, and things like that. Uh, it was just a good opportunity to, to see what it takes to actually uh, teach content to someone. And by doing that, I got a, uh, number one, I got a great appreciation for my professors, but I also learned the importance of how important it is to be able to effectively communicate and I know you all are going to hear this a lot, um, and the reason you hear it a lot is because it's 100% true that, especially when you get out in the uh, startup world, uh, the most important skill that you have isn't necessarily your technical ability, it's your ability to communicate what you are able to do. Uh, if you can't clearly communicate the great idea that you have, no one's going to hear about it and no one's going to care. They're definitely not going to give you any money. Uh, as an investor, uh, if you can't clearly articulate what you're trying to do. So every opportunity that you can to, to get up in front of a, a crowd and, and be able to talk about something technical uh, to a wider variety of audiences, I, I would suggest that you um, take advantage of that. Um, am I doing on time, 14? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so after that, uh, I got into a, uh, another program called the GK12 program where uh, I went to, got a chance to go to Kenya, um, got a chance to take some of the engineering projects that we developed for the uh, summer music technology summer camp that Young Move runs and uh, take them over there and just get an opportunity to, to see how um, uh, students that grew up in a different uh, education environment, they kind of use the, the British system, um, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, which is a little bit different, but um, 
it's just a great opportunity to, to travel. Uh, I never thought I would ever be able to get a chance to go to Kenya. So uh, I get to go for almost free. Uh, the, direct, uh, the program paid for a lot of it. So uh, definitely take advantage of any study abroad or travel opportunities. This is a great time to get uh, free travel, to get free passport stamps. So please take advantage of that. Um, um, yeah, it was a great opportunity to, to be able to kind of take what I was learning and go and kind of drop it off to a, uh, another group of students. Um, yeah, so that, that's generally how uh, kind of I got from undergrad to grad school. Uh, so while I was in grad school, um, my area of focus was on um, music, in, uh, music information retrieval, specifically music recommendation systems. Uh, that kind of focused on using musical influence as a metric for recommending music to people. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about my project was that the um, number one it is interesting because a lot of people were looking into influence as a, as a way to recommend music. Uh, so a lot of the kind of the, the techniques and things we had to borrow and kind of adapt for uh, the uh, for my thesis. Um, but also it was interesting because the, the end goal wasn't actually the recommendation system itself. It was actually um, the uh, trying to interpret how the, uh, we, the model that we built was actually learning about uh, influences and trying to classify uh, artists um, based on like really small snippets of music and trying to figure out how, um, <clears throat> how the, the machine was actually learning how to classify that information. And uh, so it was, it was really more of an in-depth look into um, the inner workings of a model. Um, <clears throat> so being able to kind of do that analysis and being able to kind of figure out, you know, why is this working? Why is this happening? Um, was actually a really good um, kind of training for a startup because um, even though startup is, is really results driven, um, you, uh, you do need to be able to kind of analyze and kind of build into, you do need to kind of develop these analytical skills and to be able to kind of take, uh, you know, the, that information and be able to, again, uh, communicate effectively to uh, your, your investors and, and your, your bosses and things like that, what you're doing and why you're doing it, which is a big question, uh, especially in AI, it's a difficult question to answer. So kind of being able to dig into these models and things like that really gave me, um, I was not using spike neural networks. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, I was using a uh, convolutional neural network. Um, uh, this was like back when, this was kind of before like the neural network, this was like right when it was starting to take off. So uh, these were using a lot of, a lot of the uh, more basic, now basic kind of architectures for neural networks. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of my grad school life. Um, and after grad school, I got an opportunity to, to be a uh, research assistant with Young Moo and then work in the Excite Center. And um, um, one of the things that I kind of drove me to the startup uh, kind of world was that I'd been working so long in, uh, not working, but yeah, working and also involved with um, academia that uh, I kind of wanted to see um, what the kind of other side, the corporate side of things, kind of, kind of how they work. So I uh, took a side job uh, working for a uh, another startup actually up in New York. Um, They're using artificial intelligence to look at um, data and trying to build relationships between salespeople and customers by looking at social media content. Um, and um, the company was called uh, Grapevine. Um, but they, uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, it was interesting. It was fun. Uh, I went up to New York a couple times. They, they paid me a, a lot of money actually <laughs> to do, uh, some really simple things, things that in academia would get no, like people would stare at you, like trying to even present that as a project, but you go out to the corporate world and like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. I can't believe you can do this. Um, and, uh. That was uh, it was just it was just interesting to kind of see see that side of things, um, and so after that experience, I kind of um, uh, thought about it some more, and I was like, you know, what, I'm gonna go ahead and make the jump. Um, so I um, 
it's funny enough, I actually met, um, good, I got 10 minutes. Um, I actually met um, the, uh, the CEO of the company I work with now called Lithero uh, at church. I was looking for a volunteer opportunity um, to, to kind of help build out a computer lab uh, that they were interested in building out. And uh, he was running the company. He was looking for uh, somebody that had AI experience. Um, and I said, yeah, I'll help you find somebody. I'll, uh, you know, I'll act as an advisor for the company and, and you know, I'll go from there. Uh, but I was continuing to kind of, you know, um, work in the lab and kind of build out uh, apps. And I was just kind of doing my own thing. I wasn't really kind of focused on uh, joining the company. Um, so we started to work together. And um, this was back in 2018. And um, yeah, it, it just turned into a, a, a really good relationship. As I learned more about the business and kind of talked to some of the customers that um, the uh, my manager or manager the CEO uh, Nyron um, was uh, kind of dealing with, kind of looked at it as a real problem. Um, and uh, just to sum up what Lithro does, um, without getting too far into the weeds, uh, Lithro is a company that helps pharmaceutical companies with what we call marketing compliance. Um, Basically, in the United States and in Australia, uh, I think those are the only two, there might be one other, one other country that does it, but those are the only two countries that uh, allow pharmaceutical companies to directly promote their materials, their drugs, their products to uh, consumers. Every other country in the world, uh, pharmaceutical companies create material for doctors. Uh, so obviously, when trying to talk to lay people or people that don't have a medical background. Um, it's very easy to uh, put out information that may be detrimental to them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what we do as a company is we have built a tool that uh, allows pharmaceutical companies to submit their marketing content uh, to us. And we go and we scan their content and we look for marketing compliance violations. And these are things that um, they seem small, like uh, a lot of spelling errors or, uh, you know, uh, you're saying that uh, leaving off a, a percentage of a, like if a drug cures cancer, uh, you saying that a drug cures cancer versus you saying that a drug cures cancer in uh, males over the age of 50, right? There's a very big difference between those two statements. Um, but it's, it's easy enough to leave that information off and um, it happens a lot more than you think. Um, and so we build out a tool that will automate the process of kind of checking those documents um, for those mistakes and kind of helping speed up the process, um, which is actually 100% manual right now. Um, Believe it or not, a lot of pharmaceutical companies are printing off like large binders of documents and like tr like taking them like manually walking them over to another person's desk and saying, hey, check these. Uh, and they'll go over them and they'll proofread them and mark them up and then they'll take them over to somebody else and they'll drop them off and they'll they'll do that. And they'll go. Um, uh, we're trying to change a document. Uh, it could easily take two to three weeks to, to just put out a single piece of content. So the brochures in the doctor's office that you see, the um, uh, emails that you may get, the commercials on TV, like they take a very long time to um, basically proofread. And so what we wanna do is we wanna kind of capture some of that low hanging fruit uh, in terms of checking things like spelling and grammar mistakes. Uh, you know, making sure that um, your dates are correct and, and a bunch of other things that, um, uh, that we do. Um, <clears throat> um, trying to automate that process and kind of speed up. So we use a bunch of different artificial intelligence tools uh, to kind of make that happen. Um, <laughs> um, so that's kind of uh, what we do. Um, this is a slide that I show to a lot of our customers. Um, I kind of talked about it a lot already, but kind of the big deal about uh, the product that we create called Lara is that it speeds up uh, time. It takes time away, um, allows time for uh, users to be able to um, 
instead of being uh, proofreaders and editors to be able to use their degrees, uh, their PhDs, their MDs, their law degrees, um, to be able to actually you know, uh, research drugs, uh, you know, develop relationships with doctors and you know, run clinical trials and things like that. So that's kind of what we want to do. We want to kind of want to shift the focus of um, those people from checking information on documents to, you know, making drugs and uh, the, the impact of the company better. Um, and hopefully by doing that also slightly decrease the product uh to at least decrease the price of drugs uh it's kind of where we're, we're our general kind of um <clears throat> uh, can you hear me now okay uh sorry about that please yeah let me know if my audio dips in and out um um so uh Kind of wanted to talk about uh, startups and how my engineering degree kind of played into that. One of the big things about engineering is uh, you are taught to um, be versatile or to be uh, very resilient. Um, and I, like I remember, there were nights where we stayed up late, uh, me and a study group, and to study for tests where we were happy to get um, 20, 30 percent. Uh, that was a that was an A, like they passed me great, they graded on the curve, and a lot of I think a lot of that hopefully has been uh, phased out now. But when I was coming through engineering, like it was a a badge of honor to get like past that class that gave out like twenty or thirty percent. Um, so um, you know, being able to just be very tenacious and um, kind of a uh, you know, being able to, to use your resources to, to find the answers or to find the uh, the solutions to problems and things like that. So being able to to kind of take that resiliency that you develop as an engineer, um, which I think is definitely a part of your training. Um, and I hope that you all kind of realize that uh, and stick to it. Um, and um, taking that uh, all combined with um, the um, different um, Opportunities that I got to be able to um, <clears throat> teach, uh, travel. Um, I got a chance to to learn about new music styles uh, with Young Boo's uh, lab, um, and just being able to kind of interact with an environment um, outside of its kind of technical domain, um, <laughs> and to uh, to be able to kind of blend those two things together um, is what really made me. Um, a perfect fit for for a startup um as a startup you're going to be a, have to wear you're gonna you're gonna need to be a technical expert 100 percent um that's why they, they brought you on uh to the, the uh, that's why they'll bring you into the company uh they're, they're looking for someone with technical expertise that they don't have uh they also are not taking advantage of you but they are essentially looking for uh the cheapest labor that they can get. Um, so that is something that you you do need to be a, aware of. Um, if you are at all concerned about um, you know financial situation and things like that, um, you may would just want to take a, 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 a take a deep look at startups um, um, and the uh, basically the, the the risk that they involve. Um, they are a, a inherently risky process. Uh, you know the statistics. Most startups fail um, at the uh, the beginning, um, and so just being able to to kind of um, be willing to kind of ride that out, um, which again, where that that tenacity for becoming an engineer has um, uh, that's a lot of that plays into that. Um, uh, as a uh, uh, the startup that I'm working for, Lithro, particularly, is a um, where they needed a lot of help was the uh, the research in. Uh, they had a lot of technical expertise about setting up uh, network architectures and, and things like that, but uh, they were really struggling with trying to um, to uh, build up um, the different tools and models and techniques uh, in um, with uh, like um, in the realm of AI, and so uh that's where i came in uh and i was able to kind of help them out i was able to kind of uh take them from <clears throat> if anybody knows anything about artificial intelligence they were using uh naive Bayes models to do some very complicated things 
Um, so kind of taking them from that point to uh, where we're using more sophisticated kind of architectures to solve more complex problems. Um, just a, a great opportunity to kind of use my engineering degree to be able to do that. Also, at the time, um, I had to explain a lot of the, the, the things that I was doing. So again, I, I got a chance to take that, uh, that teaching component um, with the TA and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, GK12 program. Um, got an opportunity to kind of take the skills that I learned and being able to present complex content uh, to people who are, uh, may not be technically familiar with what you're talking about and to be able to kind of talk to them about what you're doing and why you're doing it and inform them so that they can make informed decisions um, um, on the tools that they need to use that interact with what I was building. Uh, so it's just a really, uh, yeah, it was just a really good opportunity to kind of take uh, what I was doing and what I was learning and kind of use it in a real world um, situation. <laughs> um, Some of the things that I kind of had to deal with as a, uh, an AI um, uh, engineer was there are a lot of customers have a lot of terrible misconceptions with artificial intelligence. Uh, they, they're afraid that you know, we're going to get Skynet. Uh, they're afraid that they're going to take their jobs. Uh, we actually ran into a, uh, an issue with one of our clients where uh, one of the, the uh, people that were handing off the, uh, the data that we needed to train our models um, was very threatened. Uh, about uh, kind of us coming in and kind of taking taking on that role. Um, and what they didn't realize was that they were going to be freed up to do a bunch of other things and make themselves even more valuable to the company. Uh, but they saw it as a threat. And so they actually slowed our process down uh, to the point where we were waiting about four months to get uh, data that we needed to train their models. Um, so one of the things that as an engineer is you're going to have to be able to again learn how to deal with people's misconceptions about what you do in your subject area uh and you're gonna have to be, become really good at, at convincing people that you're not there to take their jobs um kind of the other challenges uh that i looked at i talked a little bit about ip sharing but especially with ai you need data to feed your models uh people are very reticent to give you data um so you're going to need to be creative and find uh, different routes of uh, number one, getting the data, securing it, but then also looking at a lot of open source solutions and things like that. Um, let me see. Uh, research versus production is a big one um, that I keep running into. I still struggle with this one. Um, as an academic and as a student, your goal is to get the best grade possible, not necessarily create the cleanest final product, uh, where you know thousands of people may potentially be using your software, you just want a working version of what you can do that's going to give you you know that A in your class. Uh, building out something for research is very different than building out something for production. Um, <clears throat> where uh, production is all about polish and cleaning those things off and making sure that it's very, your your systems are robust. Uh, and that it's not enough to just work once. They have to work over and over again perfectly every single time. So being able to kind of make that transition to focus on uh, actually the, the theoretical piece of it also, but then also the practical piece of how you're going to use it. Um, you have speed and memory concerns, and you have to worry about uh, cost analysis versus, um, you know, everybody in, in research wants to get the newest especially in AI research wants to get the newest GPUs and to build out these huge kind of server farms and like just rip through, you know, tons of data sets and things like that. Uh, that's just not feasible for a lot of startups. So we don't have the capital to do it. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing these polls come by. I think they're there. Uh, you guys are hilarious. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, so you, you kind of have to take these things into concern. I know they briefly touch on it in your your, uh, your engineering education, but it is actually very important. Um, and so if you're, you're interested in like trying to, if you're interested in the details and polishing things and, you know, taking a, a research project and kind of even pushing it even further to make it even cooler, um, you're definitely on the track to uh, uh, becoming a really useful asset to a, a startup company. Um, and the other thing that kind of took me by surprise was that um, uh, it says must perform many roles in the company. I wasn't surprised by that, but a lot of the roles that I took on were actually more business related than actually um, 
uh, technically related. Um, I had to sit in meetings with clients and, and kind of help them kind of piece, um, kind of parse through, uh, you know, what we were actually doing. I had to take part in um, helping build out a uh, solution to, um, you know, how, how not a solution, but our, our strategy to how we are going to talk to customers, taking this, these extremely technical concepts, what they needed to know about that information and what they didn't and kind of kind of taking on a uh, more of a, uh, a sales and marketing role um i've had to to to, to sit in uh, a couple of meetings where we were talking about finances of a company and trying to understand uh you know uh why we're we're going this route versus this route um so um i think that a uh, kind of a big part of this is being able to not just where you're uh, not just learn about engineering concepts, but also you're going to have to learn about business, um, business ideas and like why things are, um, why, why you may speak to a customer a certain way or why you may kind of push them in certain areas versus others. Um, because a lot of this, uh, even though you have a really great product, uh, they don't really care about that from like the, 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 uh, the, the speed in which you're able to to process, you know, a certain document. They really care about, you know, they may care more about accuracy or, or something like that. So you need to be able to kind of pull those things out and you can't really do that sitting behind a computer. You need to go interact with the, uh, the company and uh, the way that they talk is a lot of, um, uh, a lot of it is based around uh, kind of financial decisions and, and business concepts. That's where they're coming, kind of coming from it. So it really kind of um, affects, um, it really helps you out if you kind of have that background. Um, is what I'm trying to say. Um, benefits of AI. Uh, a lot of these are I'm pretty sure for what I roll right through these. Uh, you get to get in on the ground floor of the company. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, a partial. I own a piece of, of Lyft. It's a very small piece, but you know, I, I, <laughs> uh, when I when when Lyftro makes it big and we're selling selling off the company for billions and billions of dollars, you know, I. I get a little piece of that. Uh, it may be a very, very small piece, uh, but you know, it, it's it's a, just a kind of a cool, cool uh, idea uh, in theory. Um, something that you do need to take into account is you need to be able to understand how uh, startups work, particularly the investment piece. Um, something I didn't get a really chance to talk to here, um, but uh, it's actually very important to be able to kind of monitor how investors are coming into your company and what what part of the uh, percentage that they're taking over and how much of an influence they have on your uh, uh, your your kind of your core team uh, to be able to make decisions for the company. Um, we have uh, purposely chosen to uh, be very careful about who we uh, who we invest with, just so that we um, are able to kind of build out the company that we want to. So if you guys start up. Uh, do any startups don't just jump in the first company that offers you a billion like a million dollars make sure you do your homework and figure out how they run their companies and how they kind of interact with the uh the companies that they're looking into um <clears throat> uh ai you to control your code base and tool set uh, i got to create all the tools and things that we use uh, i didn't have to come in and read somebody else's code and figure out how they were building out the tool um i got a lot of input on major company decisions um there's a lot of overall freedom uh with the uh coming in i get to set my own schedule um when we were able to do the um now when when covid hit uh just because of how we worked we were able to kind of switch over pretty seamlessly uh to a remote process and um I actually got more work done in uh, covid than we did in the um uh in the office that we worked with um so you know it, it's uh just overall freedom working for a startup uh, that's a lot more flexible and mobile than a lot of these larger companies and again benefits you get to perform many roles in the company so i got an opportunity to sit in those meetings with the businesses and kind of talk with people um and kind of learn what's important from a financial perspective um for a lot of these companies and, and um to kind of be able to <coughs> um expand my skill set uh, and be able to kind of uh, not, not just become an engineer, but also become a, a, a business person and things like that. Um, uh, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of wrap it up. Um, 
again, when we're talking about startups, uh, you realize it's both a marathon and a sprint. Uh, yes, that is Clippy. Uh, Clippy, and it just sort of is funny because we were building out a tool and a lot of people at the beginning of it called it a big uh, um, spell checker, uh, a fancy spell checker at the beginning and like a Microsoft assistant. So like we made it a goal to not be like Clippy. Um, so <laughs> that's our, uh, just my reminder to, uh, you know, uh, not be uh, not be that. Um, so yeah, that was it. Um, here's my contact information. Um, we are doing a, um, a uh, we do have a co-op. Uh, we are participating in Jersey's co-op program. So if you are interested in working for Litho, you want some more information, email me. Um, when you go into your uh, your co-op decisions, you know, feel free to look for us. And um, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is uh, opening it up to questions for you guys. All right, give it up for Brandon Morton. Yeah, so we have a few minutes left. I'm gonna to try to fire through a bunch of these questions, kind of lightning round style. Uh, let's see, what's the best part of working at Lithro? Um, the, uh, the freedom, again, I get a chance to kind of design everything. Uh, I, I got a chance to build out a tool that a company is like saying will save them millions and millions of dollars. So being useful to somebody is actually really cool. Okay. Uh, let's see, what kind of responsibility does your company hold if they get something wrong? Mm. Uh, so luckily for us, we have great lawyers and a lot of that, <laughs> as a startup, you need great lawyers. Uh, a lot of that responsibility does fall on the company. Uh, we don't make any decisions. We, we promote ourselves as a tool to um, offer advice. So you can make this decision whether you want to or not, but that is solely up to you. We're just giving you the information. Uh, so that's, uh, we, we don't have to worry about that too much. <laughs> Here's one that everybody, uh, I think will apply to everybody. How do you build uh, relationships with professors? Right? Oh. And then how do you, and how do you, especially in a virtual environment, uh, and then how do you maintain that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, the easiest thing to do is you got to realize that they're people, uh, they love to talk. Uh, the reason they came to teach was because they want to teach and they, <laughs> gen they generally like to teach people. Uh, they may not always be uh, uh, the easiest person to, to get in touch with and things like that, but they are generally excited about what they're talking about, um, especially if they run a research lab. You know? um, so, yeah, go 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 join their lab meetings. Go talk to them about, hey, I read this article um, um, about this topic. Um, you know, get in like just basically like have a conversation. You know, it doesn't have to be deep, doesn't have to be meaningful, but like after class, just say, hey, uh, you know, great class. Uh, where can I go find some information, more information about this? Ask questions, kind of just, just get in their face. You're going to have to be annoying <laughs> to basically build a relationship with a professor. It's just the way it is. <laughs> I'm going to amend that just slightly, which is that, of course, you know, it's great when people come talk to professors. Um, it helps if you know just a little bit about that professor and their lab or with their research area. So it's not like, you know, I, I, I have this joke that, you know, at the beginning of every term when we're not in COVID, right, I get knocks on my door and said, hey, Professor Kim, I'm really, really interested in music information retrieval. <laughs> right? So, you know, just to know what you're asking about. And then a little, just a little bit. I mean, you know, and most of us are pretty nice. Most of us, not all of them, but most of us. <laughs> Uh, let's see, more questions for you. And I realize we're almost at the end. So I, hold on, sorry, quick logistics. I did post the link for this week's survey. Of course it is required. So, and I see responses coming in. Uh, and the link is also on Blackboard Learn. Um, and then again, if you're interested in those extra credit opportunities, uh, I posted them earlier in the messages. They're also linked in Blackboard Learn as well. Okay, a couple more questions for, for Brandon Morton. Uh, Dr. Brandon Morton, let's see. Uh, answer that, answer that. Um, okay. What, what other qualities do you think, uh, it's directed at you, but I'll just say in general, uh, make a good engineer stand out. Uh, you spoke about communication. Are there it, other qualities that you would point to? Uh, communication is the biggest one. Um, uh, I would say being able to creatively solve problems um, makes you invaluable. Uh, you have a lot of constraints. Uh, at a startup. So being able to um, kind of creatively solve those things makes you a big deal. Uh, and 
it, funny enough, being likable is a huge, uh, you know, you don't have to be like the most, you know, socially perfect person in the world, or whatever. But if you can just generally, you know, not be a, a jerk, you're, uh, you'll, it'll get you very far <laughs> as an engineer. <laughs> All right. Here, here's one that they're pretty insistent on. Okay. Okay. This is about having to do with startups. How much do you think is too much percentage wise of control to hand over to an investor? Ooh, um, that's a great question. As a general rule of thumb. Um, yeah. And and the reason I, I, I that's, it is a great question. I don't think there's an easy answer to this. There is not an easy answer to this. Um, it really depends on what your goals are. Um, we are fortunate enough to be able to be in a, uh, large control percentage of our company. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's definitely over 60%, um, probably even over 70%, to be honest. Um, um, but yeah, I think you, you want to you be able to control as much as possible. So, the, the, uh, But you have to balance that out with you need capital to, to get your idea off the ground. And you need to find that balance. I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule, but um, you at least want 51% so you control your company. <laughs> uh, that's probably bare minimum. Um, <laughs> unless you really, really like your investors and you, you really, really like other people being able to tell you what to do, then 51% is probably the bare minimum you can get away with. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll add my experience. Before working coming to Drexel in 2005, I worked at a startup company for a couple of years. Um, and that answer or that question, I mean, it's, it's a different answer for every situation, right? It totally depends on your investors too. Like, you know, yes. Can you imagine working with them for a long period of time? And are they going to be good partners? Not just people looking to turn a quick buck, right? On the other hand, you know, it, it can be a constraint, right? Long-term. I mean, you're going to have to, you know, they put money in and, you know, first money in is usually first money out. So you're going to have to um, manage that, and and sometimes it's going to influence, you know, big decisions that, that are made. I don't know if you've had that experience or not, or, or you know, is it is it always sort of in the back of your head, or is it kind of like, eh, you know, whatever, we got the money. I'm no, it, it's a uh, it's in the back of our head. We're uh, again, like we, we've had to be very very careful about who we invest. There are a lot of people who are interested in investing with us, yeah. uh, but not all of them had our best interests at heart. Uh, so we, we had to do a lot of homework. We had to have a lot of difficult conversations. We had to, we had to turn down a lot of money. <laughs> um, but that, I mean, that was, that was how we wanted to, to uh, that's how we wanted our startup to, to, to run. So that, that was our decision. So can, can you actually give an example? Cause there's a follow-up question around that. Like, so how, you know, is handing over too much control, you know, that does that limit your executive and creative abilities? So can you give us an example? Maybe it's something you turned down where it's just like, no, we, we're not going to do that. Um, that you can share. I realize some of it is probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really have a good example that I can share. Um, um, I will say though that the, well, okay. I can tell you, uh, one of the, actually one of our, our, our customers, um, potentially wanted to buy us out like before we even start be, like you know grew it as a business and uh they they wanted us to basically become contract workers for a large company and it was kind of defeated the whole purpose of why we were becoming a startup to just kind of build it be able to build out our own um our own com our, our own company uh, but they, they offered us a, a lot of they promised us a lot of things and that actually the relationship actually ended up souring at the end and got into some legal things and it's it's become a whole thing um, but yeah, companies are out like they if they, if you have a good idea, they will 100% try to get it from you. <laughs> there are companies out there that will take it from you if you let them. Um, but yeah, like you, that's one of those things where you have to be, you have to be strong in how you want your company to be built and you have to be able to, you have to be willing to walk away from what seems like a good idea. Um, uh, it may not be in the long run, so. Yeah, I wish I could be more specific than that, but That's all right. it's kind of tricky. Yeah, uh, let's see, a couple other quick questions. And again, I, I realize some of you have to go and that you have other classes and, uh, you know, totally understand. Uh, but, you know, please thank the speaker on your way out if you want to leave a nice message for, for Dr. Brandon Morton. 
Um, survey is still open. Make sure you submit those. Uh, we'll hang out for a few more minutes and try to get through a few more questions. All right. Uh, let's see. It's, somebody said I keep skipping this question. So, uh, what's your favorite project at Lithro so far? Ooh, um, uh, well, I've only really worked on one large project, but uh, the uh, the thing that kind of made me the happiest was um, we were uh, dealing with a, a, a speed issue, and so I got a chance to. Uh, build out this network architecture that was pretty complicated and involved like 20 different servers and uh, had to have them all connected to me. It was really complicated, but it was just really cool to like sit back and like look at it and then like, like, ah, oh, it's working. Like you have an army of servers, like just at your, your beck and call. Um, that was, uh, that was kind of the, probably the coolest thing. So. <laughs> and just so I know, I mean, were these physical servers or are you talking about like cloud-based AWS kind uh, of thing? They were cloud-based servers, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. cloud-based servers, yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, a couple other quick questions here we'll get through. What is your biggest concern about AI misuse? Uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of it, and, and just, I mean, I don't, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, bias, perceived, perceived or unperceived bias that's built into kind of these training models. We've seen examples of it with a lot of facial recognition uh, issues, especially when people want to use these, uh, people want to build out these, these very complicated, complex AI systems. Um, and they kind of want to let them go and just do their own thing. And they don't realize that number one, that they built bias into it, just either purposely or, uh, you know, uh, by accident. Um, and that has a major, major effect on, uh, especially people uh, distant, who are disenfranchised, um, has a major impact on their lives. Um, so that's my biggest fear is not that the AI system kind of takes over. It's just that people uh, either never acknowledge that they're biased or they acknowledge their bias and they use it to their own advantage. Um, and um, which is uh, now easy to do because it's, it's hard to understand why a machine does what it does. Um, so um, that's kind of my, my biggest fear is uh, yeah. But, but, dealing with the bias problem and being willing to do the work to deal with it. All right, related to that, are companies taking caution when using AI or, or just waiting for it to take over? Mm, um, the one, the, the, it's funny, uh, pharmaceutical companies are extremely conservative uh, for the most part. Uh, so we've actually uh, like had to like kind of push them uh, they're, they're very interested in uh, AI in terms of drug research. Uh, not so much in terms of dealing with kind of processes uh, that have been traditionally done by humans um, for years. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's a, it's a pharmaceutical industry is a little bit different than in a lot of tech industries where they're, they're moving very slow. So I, I, I mean, I don't think that they'll be handing over the keys of the kingdom anytime soon. <laughs> All right, a couple other quick ones. Let's see. Uh, like, is information on how a company runs their businesses widely available to to the public, um, uh, especially in the startup phase? Let, let's. In the startup, I'm gonna say no, um, just because again, like you at startup, you gotta be very careful um, about people taking advantage of you and. Um, so we tend to kind of play things like strategy and things like that pretty close to the vest. Um, I think actually a lot of companies do that. Like there's no, like, unless you're a public company, uh, you're pretty much keeping a lot of your stuff proprietary and cause that, that, that your business process and along with your technology, your business processes are also, um, worth money. <laughs> uh, so you have to be very careful about, um, what you share with people and what you don't. So, yeah. Cause I'm sure you have competitors out there that you would love to know more about what they're doing, but they're yeah. probably keeping that under wraps and, and similarly it works both ways. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's okay. This one probably applicable to lots of people. What types of projects should computer engineers work on during undergrad? Oh, uh, anything you can get your hands on. Um, you you want to, I definitely think you should balance out, stuff that's uh would be considered more back end or you're dealing with the plumbing and but then you also want to work on things that customers and people are going to actually uh interact with one of our, our um 
more difficult things isn't actually the technical side. It's trying to decide how to convey, hey, Lara can do this. Here's a button, but this button may look different than another button. So you have to, user interface development is a huge part of this. So you want to be able to take advantage. You want to be able to involve, you want to be able to work on projects that do have a user interface component as well as a backing component. Um, uh, anything that involves working in groups is, is obviously very good and not just like small groups like we're all working on the same component but if you have multiple groups working on different pieces of a larger project uh, being able to interact with groups is very different than being, being interacting with people uh, uh, like a single individual working on the same project as you so if you get an opportunity to deal with that I think that's uh, a good kind of uh, good project to work on as well all right two more a philosophical question is it possible for an AI system to develop bias organically? Mm, I don't think so. Um, because I think their source data has to come from somewhere. Um, and I think a lot of the, like, if you're talking about supervised learning, obviously that data is labeled. I'm, I'm kind of getting into the weeds here. But uh, someone's labeled that. And, you know, that, that's bias right there. If it's an unsupervised system, the way that you collect the data um, has, a, has a big deal on uh, how you, uh, like, what, what you clean, what you remove, what you, you say is good and bad in that clean data. Like, a lot of that has to deal with that as well. So I don't think a system can inherently create their own bias. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe so. I mean, I'll add to that. I mean, it's definitely data dependent. Right. I mean, it, you, what you train it is what it's going to learn. On the other hand, there is this aspect of, you know, certainly deep nets that are, you know, very, very sort of black boxy. Right. We don't exactly know. It's very difficult to know exactly what features they're latching onto. Right. So if you, you know, if it, it could be things in your data set that you don't even know are there. Right. Yeah. That it could that could get start to entrain it. Uh, all right, last one, and then we'll let it, I mean, well, everyone is, this is post-show now, right? This is the post-show, so, but the last question I have on the board here is uh, about uh, your your work as a DJ. Uh, is that <laughs> something you're keeping up? Are you are you still able to do that, especially in the COVID era? Uh, no, it's it's like, I'm, I'm, if you can see my, like, I'm literally sitting in front of my, my setup right now. Uh, I haven't touched it in a while. Um, it's something that I want to um, I used to actually be like a, a working DJ. I would do weddings and things like that. Um, I put that on a hold. Um, I, I, uh, it is much harder to go out late at night when you have a wife and a kid on the way than it is to uh, than it is when you are a grad student and uh, don't really respect sleep in the way that you probably should. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But no, I I, uh, I still do it as a hobby. I still collect records and all that kind of stuff. I'm a big fan of vinyl, so um, I still like to do it. Uh, I'm just not out in uh, public as much anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if uh, you, uh, it's easy enough to share this, but Brandon has a great hip hop 101 playlist. So if you uh, that he's that he's been nice enough to share with me. So, all right, I think we'll wrap things up there. Thanks everyone who's still on board. I know this is, this is the post show anyway. So, you know, there's still 19 people hanging out here. Uh, so thanks for being here. Um, either that or they've fallen asleep, but you know, that, that <laughs> happens too. But thank you so much, Brandon. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's great, fun. great talk and um, you know, good luck. Oh, but well, obviously good luck with Lithro and then of course, good luck with the baby on the way. Thank you. Uh, thank that, you. That's going to be amazing. And, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to catch up soon, um, you know, without uh, having, you know, to deliver a class. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and, you know, I, oh, darn it, I, I forgot to mention this. Little, uh, well, they have to show up anyway next week. I was going to plug the next speaker. But um, I think I sent you the flyer with all the, did I send you the flyer with all the, spe all the speakers we have all lined up for the? I think I got the next couple in the, yeah, in the flyer, yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that's the short-term flyer. We have the one that has like all all nine or ten speakers. Okay. Uh, I'll send that to you as well. Because uh, you know, hey, it's it's we're doing it remotely. The 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 great thing is that we can bring in speakers from just about anywhere. Yeah. Right? So that's you know, cool. hey, why not? If if we're not <laughs> limited to just you know bringing people into Philly, let's let's bring them in from everywhere. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you. You've been a great sport. Uh, appreciate your your time. And uh, yeah, good luck with everything.
Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. And class, I'll see you next week.